Good morning, good morning. How are you? That, uh, the, the, the last song, that's a very special song for me. Uh, I, uh, I wasn't a, like a, a year into the, my new life in Christ, and, and we went to a concert by David Meese, and that's where I surrender to the Lord, my calling. I knew that the Lord was calling me, but I was just pretending that, oh no, it's just, it's me, but it was with that song that the Lord that really broke me down, and I surrender, and I said, yes, Lord, you're calling me, and I'm, I'm here. I'm going to obey you, Lord. Just show me the next steps to take to fulfill your calling, and thank God, you know, he's faithful, and I'm here. Amen. All right? Well, now, as you can see, this is the title of the message it's not next week we're going to begin a continue with first Thessalonians but i wanted you to get you ready for the christmas season that already started once thanksgiving is it's uh, over we go to the thanksgiving season and uh, we know several years ago began the war against christmas secularism fighting to remove everything that has to do with Christmas from the biblical perspective and uh, changing the biblical perspective of Christmas to a secular perspective of Christmas, okay? And um, we can see it, for example, the, uh, the, the cards, the Christmas cards and, and the signs. Now they don't want to even have the name of Christ, Chris, because Christmas is about Christ, right? So they just put... Mary, and then an X, Xmas. Now they, they want to get rid of the, they don't want you to, to see Christmas from that perspective. They say the religious perspective. No, it's offensive to many people, the religious perspective. So we don't want to offend people by having the, the name of Christ, religion. So... And instead of having a, a manger here, instead of having a, a Santa Claus is, is the, the focus, okay? That's the secular, okay? That's the secular. And one of the reasons why they fight the biblical perspective because they, many of them, they claim that Christmas is not a historical event. That's why the, the title of the message is Christmas, a historical event, or is it just a myth, Okay? It's just a myth. They say, no, 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 they, they, they changed it. They came up with so many things, and they have changed the Bible through the years, and this group changed the Bible, and the Jews, and then, and, and then come up with so many stories that uh, you have to believe that Christmas in reality is a myth. And uh, so the, there's nothing wrong with really changing one myth for another one, because that's the one that they are really... Uh, posing before us the secular meaning of Christmas. So you see the difference between um, that type of uh, Christmas card to the real one, where it says, have a blessed Christmas, okay? Not an X, but it's about Christ. It's about Christ. So the, the war is between these two worldviews, hmm? How we see the world, if we see the world from the biblical perspective or the secular perspective. And the war is constantly waging on to change our minds and for us to, to little by little accept the, the other way of looking at Christmas, celebrating Christmas. Hey, don't be religious. People get offended. Don't talk about Christ or, or the real meaning of Christmas. So that's why... This message is more, um, it's more like a defense of our faith, a defense of historical Christmas, okay? So that way you can have more weapons when you talk with other persons, with people, and, and then the conversation comes, and then you can have uh, more... Uh, 
more tools to help people understand why Christmas is what it really is. It is a historical event, okay? It's a historical event. We're not making up stories, but it's a historical event. Now, uh, for us, you see, we have nativity. And just a few years ago, you would see nativities even in the mall. Even in churches years ago, they, they, they had nativities. In public squares, there were nativities. The city, in parks, they would put a, a beautiful, big nativity. But not, not anymore. Now, nowadays, just, you know, in Amazon. You can go and search on Amazon. Uh, Christmas, you can put Christmas uh, ornaments. And it's going to be, I did it, 100% secular ornaments. 100% secular ornaments. Okay? You have to put uh, religious Christmas ornaments. And then they're going to bring some of them. Okay? But the very first, if you just put Christmas ornaments, number one, all the secular. That's what it's going to come out. Secular, secular, secular. And uh, so now, you see, you put uh, Christmas ornaments. It's not, it doesn't come out with this. It come out with this. <laughs> Those are the Christmas ornaments nowadays. Santa's toy shop. So which one is his history? Satan, uh, Satan, <laughs> Santa, <laughs> it's very close, right? <laughs> Santa, <laughs> Santa's shop, or the nativity? Which one is historical? See, but they're pushing for for the other one, for the other one. Like in the past, uh, schools, different schools, public schools, they would show this movie you know, before they went on vacations they would show a movie uh, about Christmas and it was the first Christmas but nowadays yeah, they're showing movies but they're showing Santa Paws <laughs> now they're showing that kind of movies so as you can see we are in a real war and uh, the reason why the secular perspective is really gaining ground is because sometimes us Christians, we remain silent and silent. And, and maybe because we don't have the tools to defend Christmas as a historical event. And we don't have the tools, we don't have the arguments, and uh, that's why we just remain silent and silent. But the question is, why is Christmas a historical event? So I'm, I'm going to go, you know, very fast uh, through three points that in reality uh, each point could be a series of messages, like the first one, uh, the historical reliability of the Bible, okay? We believe that Christmas is a historical event because it's in the Bible and the Bible is reliable as a historical book. Amen. Hmm? As a historical book, okay? And, and from that, we can prove it with the manuscripts. That is a historical, reliable book. First century historians, what they wrote about Christ, okay? And also the prophecies. Those three elements, they point to that the Bible is reliable, that you can trust that the Bible is a historical document that you can trust. So if the Bible is a historical book with documents that you can trust, then Christmas is a historical event. Yeah? It's a historical event. Now, the second point that we're going to go through is the constant confirmation of biblical accounts by archaeology. Okay? Archaeology, they're constantly digging and digging, and you know that digging is very slow. They are digging, and when they find something, they have found so many things, and everything that they find doesn't contradict the Bible. On the contrary, it always brings 
reassurance that, oh yeah, this is what the Bible mentioned, and now we found archaeological proofs about this person, this event, this city, this, that. And it's important because, for example, when it comes to Mormonism, that Mormonism had their, the Book of Mormons with a new revelation, and they, they mentioned cities, they mentioned coins, they mentioned people, but archaeological diggings, they have never, ever found nothing, not even a city, not even a name, not even a coin, nothing from the Book of Mormon they have found archaeologically. But biblically, so many things. Okay, so the biblical account, and also the contributions Christianity has made through the centuries. Through the centuries, we're, we're going to see the contributions. Um, that's why the majority of people, they rather live in a country that is being influenced by Christianity than a, a, a country that is not the influence of Christianity. Because even nowadays, atheists here, they don't want to go and live in a, an atheist country. I have told them, I give you the ticket and you go to Cuba, you go to China, you go to those atheist countries and you're going to be very happy among an atheist system. <laughs> oh no, I, I like it here. Oh, okay. So you like it here. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to go very fast. Uh, going through these three points, but like I was mentioning, each point uh, is for us several messages, several messages, and then also, if you're interested, there are books uh, that talk about the reliability of the Bible, the, uh, the confirmation of archaeology, about the contributions Christianity has made to the world, with, in the, and th those books are going to give you... Uh, in-depth and detailed information when this happened, when, how, and everything. And everything always is from Christians, from Christians, okay? So let's begin with the first one, okay? The historical reliability of the Bible, okay? And we know that reliability mainly comes from the manuscripts of, okay, we say, okay, the Bible, the 66 books, okay? And we know that we only have copies of those manuscripts. We have copies. And uh, of all the copies of other historical uh, events, uh, the manuscripts of the Bible, there are those that are closer to the original event. Okay, so we have manuscripts that are closer, that are even Christianity is first century. So we have documents that were uh, that that were from the first century. So they're what we call fresh copies from the originals, fresh copies from the originals, and and uh, and we have through the years, copies and copies and copies, and those copies, they, they, they don't have changes. They are minuscule. Uh, we can say like errors when making copies, let's say like an accent for us, uh, uh, a sign or something that in reality doesn't change the message, okay? That you can see that, yeah, Humans were copying the originals, and you can have human errors, but nothing that the, the message was changed, nothing at all, okay? And see, the, the, the scribes that made sure that the original books from the Old Testament were always fresh, they, they were trained to do the copies in a very rigorous manner. Like, for example, they were copying this, the historical reliability of the Bible. They, they wouldn't go like us. They said, okay, the historical reliability of the Bible. No, they wouldn't go like that. They would go T, T, H, H, E, E. They would go like that, and once they finished the historical, then they would count the letters. One, two, three, four, 
one, two, three, four, five, okay? And then again, the, yeah, the historical, historical, they would go like that. That's how they were trained. So now comes Christ, uh, uh, Christianity, the New Testament, and the New Testament basically count, the, the, the foundation is from the Jews, okay? Paul was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, so they knew the way to transcribe and make copies of the originals. So they made the same thing with the copies of the New Testament. Very rigorously, they made copies to, to spread them all over the churches, the New Testament. And, and that's why we have, the Bible has, see, historians have roughly 25,000 manuscripts of New Testament books. I'm just giving you the, the numbers for the New Testament because we're talking about Christmas, New Testament event. 25,000 manuscripts of New Testament books, far more than any other book from ancient history. Okay? From any ancient history. You know the one that, that is number two? Number two is 2,000 copies of the Iliad by Homer. Homer. That's the second best represented manuscript. And then when you talk in secular uh, circles about the Iliad of Homer, oh, the, oh, beautiful. I remember when I was, I was taking the, um, the, the bachelor's, uh, in uh, literature, oh, we had to, to read. There's 24, like 24 books on the Iliad, okay? And we had to read, uh, not the 24, but they gave us a summary of the 24, but it was a book of 20, uh, and we had to do a, a research paper on that because uh, the professor, he, for him, it was the greatest book ever written, okay? And, and you have to study it, you have to know it, and this and that, and, and uh, but compared to, to the Bible, 25,000, but when you talk about the Bible, oh, no, 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 that, that's not a historical. And, and, and you see, and, and the copies of the Iliad, they're not fresh, fresh copies from, the, from that century. They, they're even very old copies. They're, they're not, the, it's not what they, they are called, fresh copies, like from the Bible. They're from the same century. We have copies from the, fair, the first century, not with this one. Oh, but this one, secularism, tells, oh, that's, oof, bow down before the, these writings, but not the Bible, okay? Now, uh, let's look at historians, okay? Historians that wrote during the first and second century, okay? First century is the time of Christ, the apostles, the beginning of the church. So there were historians hmm, writing and living in the time of Christ, the time of the apostles, in the time of the establishment of the church. There were historians, okay? And the, the main historians of those days that mention Jesus, mentions it, is jo Josephus, Tacitus, and Suetonius. Okay? And, and the main one is Josephus. He was, uh, uh, a, he had a, a Jewish-Roman combination. Okay? And he worked for the, for the Romans. He worked for the Romans. And one of his main uh, uh, tasks was to be a historian. That's why he had to go to the battles, the wars. But he, he was not a, uh, a warrior, but he was a historian. He, he had to write the, the historical events of Rome. Okay? And look what he wrote, because he is one of the main ones that mention um, uh, Christianity. Josephus' works are the chief are the chief source next to the Bible for the hi history of Israel and provide 
a significant and independent extra-biblical account of such figures as Pontius Pilate, Herod the Great, John the Baptist, James the brother of Jesus, and Jesus of Nazareth. He mentions all of them, okay? All of them. So, so they are historical uh, characters, see? They are mentioned by, uh, by a, a, a writer of history in an extra-biblical account, okay? Because some people are going to say, well, it's in the Bible, and you cannot trust the Bible. No, it's not just in the Bible. There are extra-biblical accounts. Hmm? So you have to understand that what the Bible is telling us is also historical, because there are other extra-biblical accounts that agree with the Bible, agree with the Bible. Okay, Let, let me show you a portion of what Josephus uh, wrote. Look, this is what he wrote in, in his book, Antiquities, because he has several historical books, but this one is um, uh, titled Antiquities. Okay, he says, at this time, hmm, see, at this time he's saying, in my time, hmm, in my time, I was still alive, I'm writing history in my time. At this time, there existed Jesus, hmm? existed Jesus, it's an historical event in my time, I saw him, uh, I'm writing a historical document telling you that he is a real person, okay? he existed, a wise man, okay? a wise man, but look, it's, if it is lawful to call him a man, he's even saying, I don't know if he, if he was just a man, okay? Because he was a witness of many of the teachings, the great works. Because, for example, the, the miracles that we have in the Bible, they're not all the things that he did. That's why we're going through John, the Gospel of John, and John tells us, look, I'm just giving you a small sample of what Jesus did, but if I were to write everything that he did, ooh, he said, I can fill the whole world with books. That he's just, you know, making a point by exaggeration. But he's saying, oh, there are so many, many things that he did, and he said, so look what he says. A wise man, if it is lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of marvelous works. You see, so he's mentioning his miracles, marvelous work. And then he says, a teacher of men who received the truth with pleasure. And that's what the Bible says. You know, see that, that people would rather listen to Jesus' teaching than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. No, 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 they, they say he, he speaks differently from them. So they enjoy listening Jesus' teach. Okay? Then he says, he attracted to him many Jews as well as many Gentiles, non-Jews. He was the Christ. Wow. The historian, Josephus, an unbeliever, he was not a Christian. But he said, well, he was the Christ. He was the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament because he knew that he was a Jew. He was also a, a, a scholar. He said, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the leaders among us, he was one of the leaders of the Romans, condemned him to the cross. Those who loved him at the beginning did not abandon him because he appeared to them alive again. He's mentioning the resurrection. See? Historical, extra biblical information about his resurrection. That that's why he's saying. And, and those that follow him, they continue to follow him because they saw him alive again. When? Look what it says there. Appear to them alive again on the third day. Wow, very accurate with the Bible. Eh? 
as the divine prophet had predicted. He said, as a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. And, and that's one of the main messages of Christmas. Hey, look, of, look at all the prophecy that was fulfilled in Christmas. And that's what he is also referring to. These and 10,000 other wonderful things about him and the tribe of Christians, that's how he calls the group of Christians, so called by him, Christians, supposedly called by Jesus, Christians, has not become extinct to this day. Like saying, uh, there's been very efforts to wipe out Christianity and all Christians, but mm, on the contrary, mm, they continue to, to be here among us. And we're still here. It's not coincidence. Okay? It's not coincidence. So we can have that assurance that not be afraid with what we believe, because it is historical. Christmas is a historical event, okay? I know that people say, how can you believe that a virgin, a virgin gave birth? How can you believe that? Because we can even find, they can even tell you, look, there are even Christians that don't believe that. They say that it's a myth. The virgin birth, it's a myth. But no, because if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, like he appeared to them alive on the third, if you believe in, in the resurrection, then you should believe in his uh, virgin birth, okay? In his virgin birth. Why believe one and not the other one? Which one is a greater miracle? Hmm? To be in the tomb for three days and then come alive? Or to be born from a virgin. For God, the Bible says, nothing is impossible. Everything is possible with God. Amen. So, if he was able to raise even Lazarus after four days of being dead, there's nothing impossible for God to have a, 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 a virgin birth. And it was fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. So, okay, let me give you in a nutshell, why we believe the Bible, okay? Why we believe the Bible. Believe the Bible because, okay, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses that report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that the writings are divine writings rather than human in origin. See? Right there you have everything encapsulated. Okay? Why believe the Bible? Okay? Why believe the Bible? When people say, but, but why? Why do you believe the Bible? You can take a picture and... That way you can meditate, and then there's, there's a passage from Peter that we're going to go through that says exactly each point that is here, Peter mentions it. So you can see the, 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 the trustworthiness, the reliability of the New Testament from, from extra-biblical, from, from other writers that mention it, and then Within the Bible, you can see that the same thing. See, you can trust the Bible, the reliability of the Bible. Let me show you. We're going to go point by point, okay? Let me show you. Uh, a reliable collection of historical documents, okay? So his, now, Peter said in 2 Peter 1.16, it says, When we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were not telling just clever stories that someone invented. Okay. See? So he's saying, hey, we're telling you history. It's not a myth. It's not clever stories that we invented in order to manipulate people. No, no, no. We're, we're, it's not something like that. So you see, even the writers of the New Testament, they were aware that what they were writing was history. Okay? 
history. They were not trying to, to deceive people. And one of the, the evidence that they were not just trying to deceive people or, or had a, a, a secondary agenda is that they were willing to die hmm, for this, for their writing, for their beliefs. They were willing to die. And it's like we have heard that saying that that nobody is willing to die for a lie, but only for the truth. Only for the truth, you're going to find a person that is willing to die, but not for a lie. For a lie, you say, they say, tell us the truth, or we're going to kill you. Okay, the truth is this is an idea, and they're like, all right, but you're not willing. But if you know that, no, the truth is, yeah, it is the truth, is the truth, is too, and bah, they can kill you, but you stuck to the truth, and that, what, that happens to, to the apostles. So it is a reliable collection of historical documents, okay? Always keep, in, keep that in mind. And then in, in the second part of verse 16, the second part, because this is, a, can you notice I just gave you the first part of verse 16. It gives us that it is written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, which is very important. If you're writing something, let's say, for example, you're writing something about me, and they are eyewitnesses of what I said, what I preached today, they can say, hey, he didn't say that. We're witnesses. He didn't do that. We are witnesses. The same thing. Nobody said, hey, you're wrong. I was an eyewitness, and now he never said that. He never did that. He ne no. Those eyewitnesses. We were in agreement, but we, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's saying, look, what we're writing is historical because we were eyewitnesses. You see, when you go to court, the strongest evidence and your stronger defense or attack is if you have eyewitnesses. If you have eyewitnesses, it, it is almost 100% sure that you're going to win the case if you have eyewitnesses. Look, let's get this eyewitness, this eyewitness, and all the eyewitnesses, they agree in the same story. So, so you, you're right, and the other person is wrong. And this is what we have in the Bible. There were other eyewitnesses, and nobody said, no, you're lying, you're, you're now coming, you're distorting the truth, this is not what he taught, this is not what he did, no, nothing at all. Now, the Apostle Peter continues telling us that the reports, that the Bible reports supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. Look what he says in, in verse 19, right there in the same passage. He says, so we have seen, we have seen the eyewitness and proved that what the prophets said came true, okay? Came true. You will do well to pay close attention to everything they have written, that the prophets have written. For like lights shining into dark corners, their words help us to understand many things that otherwise would be dark and difficult. But when you consider the wonderful truth of the prophet's words, then the light will dawn in your souls and Christ the morning star will shine in your hearts. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay. So he's telling us, hey, everything that we witness, everything that we're writing is historical and is in fulfillment of specific prophecies, okay? Specific prophecies. It's in fulfillment of specific prophecies. Now, how many prophecies do you think Jesus fulfilled? Just him in, in his life, his ministry, his teachings. Like how many prophecies do you more or less think that he did? You tell me a number. 80, 100, 
12, you, any number you gave me. You want to try? Yeah, but how many? The number? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> he fulfilled all the promises. <laughs> Hey, you see, that's a smart lady. <laughs> okay, uh, 356 prophecies, scripture fulfilling the life of Jesus. And if you don't believe me, just go to this website, and you're gonna get, you're gonna be here. This is the the Old Testament prophecy fulfillment in the New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament, and he's got, he gives you all the 356. Prophecies fulfilled by Jesus in the life of Jesus. Do you think that's coincidence? No. <laughs> There's no, no coincidence, okay? No coincidence because you see, there are like circumstances such as his birth. Do you think he could have manipulated that and say, okay, I, I am the fulfillment of these prophecies because he manipulated circumstances? No, his birth. There's no way that he could have manipulated his birth, his birthplace, his lineage, the method of execution. Everything was beyond his control and could not have been accidentally or deliberately fulfilled. It was always miraculously by, by the will of God. And when, you see, some people are going to tell you, yeah, but what about the, the prophecies of Nostradamus and the prophecies of this and the prophecies of this other person? Oh, when you study and compare prophecies, biblical prophecies with other supposedly prophets, you're going to find a real, real difference between them because Bible prophecies are not vague, okay? It's like if I say, oh, I received revelation from God, oh, oh here the Coachella Valley is going to experience a, an earthquake. Of course, right? That's very vague. But tell me the, the date and the time and the, and, and the scale of the, of the earthquake, and then I'm going to believe you that that is really a prophecy, if it is specific. And, and the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled were very specific. Even names, even names in the Bible. We have specific prophecies in the Bible deal with specific places, people, events, and names. And their fulfillment can be checked by subsequent history. Okay? So that's why I trust the Bible 100%. Say, ah, but why somebody you know, will say, but why, why do you always the Bible and just the Bible? What about you? What, what do you believe? What do you think? Why do you have to always say the Bible, the Bible, the Bible? Because to me, it's the final authority. It's the most reliable authority to me. Why should I say, well, yeah, I'm going to go to a, a different source to come up with something? I, I don't trust other sources. The only source that I trust is the Bible because I know this is the background of the Bible. And I know the background of other sources of information. And I say, Mm, no, I, I cannot trust them 100%. Okay, so I'm just going to go by the Bible. Okay, by the Bible. Okay, number four. Okay, we're going through that declaration why I believe the Bible. Okay, and number four. And claim that the writings are divine writings rather than in human origin. Okay, it's very important. That's why I trust the Bible, because I truly believe that the origin of those writings are really from God. Even though he used men, but he, you see, men is, are the writers, but God is the author. He's the author, and men are the writers. They, they wrote what the author led him to write, okay? And that's what Peter, going. this, this is the same Passage on 
2 Peter 1. It says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or by an act of human will. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Okay? They spoke from God. See, th that's why I can just trust the Bible. Because if I don't trust the Bible, if I say, well, yeah, I believe the Bible, but I don't, I don't trust it fully, well, no, then you're saying that you don't trust God. Or you don't believe that that is 100% the work of God, that God is the author of that those writings. That's what you're saying. Okay? And that's the same position of liberal theologians. That's what they say. Oh, come on. You cannot trust the Bible like that. And, and, uh, look. and then they decide, okay, this is not for Jesus. This is this. And, uh, and they come up with a Bible that is completely secular. <laughs> a secular Bible. And they have written their own understanding of what is really history and what's not history, okay? And so they don't believe what, what I believe, that the, the Bible that I have is reliable, I can trust it, and I believe that is the Word of God. And, and I'm going to stick to the Word of God, okay? Because in claim that the writings are divine writings rather than human in origin, okay? See, so even, even Peter is aware that he's being used by God to write God's writing, God's message. Hmm? That is in human, in, in divine origin, what he's writing, okay? Well, so as we can see, we've been able to cover... Um, of the, the three points, the, the historical reliability of the Bible, the manuscripts, the first century historians, the prophecies. And now let's look at the um, confirmation from archaeology. Okay, I'm just going to give you an example from uh, the work of Dr. John Currid. Okay? He is currently a faculty member at the Jerusalem Center for Biblical Studies in Jerusalem, Israel, and serves as project director of the Bethsaida Excavation Project in Israel, 1995 to the present time. Okay? And he lectures and preaches world, worldwide. Okay? So he is an expert on archaeology. And, and he gives us the... the Ten crucial archaeological discoveries related to the Bible. He says, you, you cannot just get rid of the Bible so easily and say, no, no, you cannot trust it. He says, what about all the archaeological discoveries? And he just mentions ten. He said, just, just ten. But there are many, many mines. The Rosetta Stone, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tell Down Inscription, Kedev Hinan Scrolls, Epic of Gilmolesh. Uh, Ezekiah's Tunnel, Crucified Man at Gibad Hamidbar, Ugarit Text, Moabite Stone, Lakish Letters. And, and you know, there are books that explain exactly what was in the Rosetta Stone, what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tell Down inscriptions, and it tells you how they don't contradict the scriptures but give evidence of the reliability of the scriptures. And that's what has happened with archaeology. Archaeology is constantly finding new evidence, and that new evidence, they're always waiting for, for evidence that, that is going to contradict the Bible. And no, it doesn't contradict the Bible. Okay, so ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, and all the liberal networks uh, don't mention this discovery okay, because... It doesn't contradict the Bible. Don't mention it, okay? Nothing happened. We didn't discover nothing, okay? Okay, so sometimes 
it's kind of boring reading a book on archaeology, okay? But it's necessary so you can see, so you can see the evidence that, that you can trust the Bible with all the different angles that you can see. You're going to say, okay, um, if we go and study the manuscripts, oh, you're going to end up saying, well, all right, there, there's, well, I cannot doubt about the manuscripts. Uh, first century historians, well, I was able to find first century historians that they're giving evidence about the, the reliability of the New Testament, of the Gospels, about the life of Christ, about who, who people thought he was, that he was the Christ, and that he died, he was crucified, and he resurrected at the third day. And that's why many people continue to follow him, because they, they knew that he was still alive. So, so you go to the prophecies to say, wow, 356 prophecies in, in every single detail fulfilled in the life of Jesus. This, uh, I, I have. That, that's why one of the books I read is uh, Evidence That Demands a Veredict. It's about that. It gives you all this, all this kind of evidence hmm, from, from history, from archaeology, from the manuscripts, about the prophecies, and everything It gives you detailed evidence. And that's why it says, now that you have all the evidence, what is your verdict? What is your decision? Can you trust the Bible or not? Now that you have, because sometimes you say, well, give me proof, give me evidence that this is... Oh, there's, a, there's all kinds of evidence, but are you willing to really research the evidence, read that little book of evidence that demands a verdict? But it's important, especially like me, that I, I like to think about the why and the why and the why and the why, and the why and the, uh, go crazy with the why and the why, that, that I said, no, I really want to know if, the Bible is reliable if what I'm following is true. And so I, I read the complete book and I read another one, the number two, number two, the second volume, more evidence because there's constantly coming more evidence on the trustworthiness, trustworthiness of the Bible. So more evidence for the reliability of the Bible. Okay. So, so this is from uh, archaeology, okay? And like I said, there are many, many, many more things that they have discovered archaeological that always give evidence, oh yeah, this character, yeah, it truly existed. This event, oh yeah, truly happened. Oh, the date, yeah, the date is accurate. And they constantly, 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 okay? Now, Let's look at the contributions of Christianity through the centuries, okay? Despite its humble origins, as, you, as we can read in the book of Acts, the origins of the establishment of the Christian church, Christianity has made more changes on earth for the good than any other movement or force in history, okay? That's why historians, they, they, even if they're not believers in Christ or saved, but they are historians, and a historian has, has to, to write objectively. Historians decided that he made such an impact in the life of humanity that we're going to have to date the history of humanity before Christ and after Christ. That's the impact that he made in history. So even <laughs> atheist countries, they have to say, oh, we became uh, an atheist country in the year, and they have to mention after Christ. 
<laughs> okay, and you're eight years old. You cannot get away from history, okay? Because it is really historical. So you see, all this information that I'm giving you, like I told you, it's like an apologetic message. Apologetic means giving reasons for your faith. So you can, you can trust. You can trust the Bible. You can trust that Christmas is a historical event. Okay? Okay. Now, to get an overview of some of the positive contributions Christianity has made through the centuries, I'm just going to give you a few highlights. And like I tell you, this can be a, a series of messages of, of the contributions of Christianity, what Christianity brought to the world. Okay? This is what Christianity brought to the world. Uh, hospitals. Sometimes we think that hospital has always existed. No, they existed with the influence of Christianity. Okay? And they began during the Middle Ages. Hmm? With the influence of Christianity. Universities, which also began during the Middle Ages. Okay? In addition, most of the world's greatest universities were started by Christians for Christian purposes. And that's the battle with many uh, uh, universities here in the United States, like Harvard and Yale, that are in the front. They have the purpose for our university, and the purpose is to honor God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And they say, you have to remove them. It's history. That's how this university was founded. But no, no, we are offended every time that we see it. And they're working on removing that and removing that. But, but that's, the, that's history. Why remove history? If it's a reality, literacy, see, and education. It's also oh, comes the influence of Christianity, the education for masses, for everybody. Okay, everybody's going to be educated. Okay, everybody. Capitalism, okay, and the free enterprise. It, it, it comes from, from Christianity. From Christianity, capitalism and enterprise. Representative government, okay, like, like the one that we have here in the United States. In the United States, we don't have a democracy. Some people say, oh, we have a democracy. No, we don't have a... We have a representative government, which is a republic. It's a republic. All right? And um, uh, separation of political powers. It comes from the influence of the Bible. Civil liberties. Okay, it not, doesn't come from the left. Okay, civil liberties come from the influence of Christianity. The abolition of slavery, both in antiquity and in more modern times. Okay, if there's a country, a place where they practice uh, uh, slavery and Christianity comes in and people are influenced by the teachings of the Bible and their minds are transformed, are changed, and their world vision changes, slavery is going to be abolished. Eventually, it's just going to be the result of a changed mind by the influence of Christian teaching. Christian teaching. Modern science. And that's why the, the, the mistake that we make nowadays is to... Like put in competition. Do you believe in, in the Bible or in science? <laughs> oh, what a great mistake. Don't, don't go. Don't do that. Okay? Because all the scientists from the past that, that began uh, uh, science, they were Christians. And they would say, well, God is a God of order. And he is the, the lawgiver. Everything works with laws. So let us discover the laws of nature. Because nature is God's nature. It's God's creation. Let's discover it. And they begin doing investigation, discovery. And that's how they begin to discover everything that we have now. And, and science, science in reality is it's, uh, the science of God. 
It's not us, man. We didn't, we didn't invent those laws. We just discover the laws and God allow us since, since they had that and most likely God put their thoughts in their minds of figuring out uh, the laws of nature. And God said, yeah, that's the way. Do it. I'm going to help you discover for the benefit of humanity. And now, now we have all those discoveries for our benefit and it's all come from God come from God. So never have modern science uh, in fight with Christianity because that's, that's one of the main arguments. How can you say that there is no God when you see this universe, when you see nature, how everything works according to laws? So the laws that govern my body to, to live and to be healthy, all those laws, do you think they, they came by chance or by a lawgiver? Every time that you find something that operates according to a law, uh, uh, then there's a lawgiver behind. The same way with the world. Everything is being operated according to different laws, the, the law of, of gravity, the law of this, and there's a lawgiver behind that, and that's God. It's not chance. It's not chance. You will never see an airplane being built by chance. Oh, an airplane is built. No. By intelligent mind, then we have building what we have discovered. Okay, so modern science, the discovery of the new world by Columbus. See, because in the day of Columbus, they thought that the world was flat like this. So that's why they were afraid to sail far away because they said, oh, we're going to fall. If we sail far away, we're going to fall. But Columbus... Christopher, he was a believer reading the Bible in Isaiah said, but the Bible says about, it speaks about the roundness of the earth. So if I sail far, I'm not going to fall. I'm going to find another world. I'm going to find more land. I'm not going to fall. So don't, don't go. It's very dangerous. You're going to fall. No, I believe what the Bible says about the roundness of the earth. Okay. So the discovery of the new world by like Columbus, the elevation of women, you know, how they seen women just also like a, like a property, just property of men. And they can dispose of property any way they want it, okay? So um, benevolence and charity, the Good Samaritan ethic, and, and you will see that. You will see that. That's, that's what we're doing in missionary works. We're doing uh, benevolence and charity, helping the, the poorest people in Mexico. When we go to um, the missionary trip, that's what we're doing. And, and all that is the influence of Christianity. Higher standards of justice, influence of Christianity, the condemnation of adultery, homosexuality and other sexual perversions, this has helped to preserve the human race and it has spared many from headaches. So that's all, all that I'm showing you is what is called uh, Western culture. Western culture is the culture that is being influenced by Christianity. You can go to other countries, let's say you go to India, and it's not uh, influenced by Christianity, by, by Hinduism and other beliefs, and, and, and you say, how come they are so poor? We should help them. They, they're so poor. they are poor because of their worldview. Okay? Their worldview. Their, their worldview is not affected by Christianity. It's affected by, by lies. How come they don't have enough food for the people? Because they believe in reincarnation, so they don't kill 
the animals, they don't kill, kill the rats, and the, the cows and the animals, the bulls, the rats, are eating the crops. So you see how it can affect what you believe for good or for bad? So when you have the influence of Christianity, it's going to be for good. And that's what we are enjoying. And that's why we rather live here in the United States and not in India. Not in India. Even you say, I'm a Buddhist. Okay, go, uh, go to India. No, I'm, uh, I'd rather be a, a capitalist Buddhist. Or, uh, Oh, yeah, you, you like the Western culture, right? And that's the result of the influence of Christianity. High regard to human life. We believe what the Bible teaches, human life. Life is the crown of creation, human life. Uh, the civilizing of many barbarian and primitive cultures, Christianity, that's, that has done that, that change in many cultures. Greater development of arts and music, inspiration for the greatest works of art. You see, the, the, the greatest thing of going to Europe it's only to see the uh, antiquity, things of antiquity, the, the buildings. You, know, you see, I, I was so amazed to see the buildings, but they're not modern buildings. All are the buildings that were built when Christianity was at its peak in Europe. And uh, one of the... Um, the, um, that was leading our group of tourists, he explained this, you know why all the buildings are so beautiful that your, your pictures are not going to give uh, really, uh, they're not going to tell the, the true story about what you are looking. So those buildings were built and they gave us the date. And the purpose for building it this way, it was to represent the glory of God, the greatness of God, the beauty of God, and the great salvation in Christ. That was the purpose of, of these buildings. So said, and then he said, but ironically, now nobody comes to worship. <laughs> so they're just for, the, for us to go and see and to be at all, what Jesus inspired in those days. Okay? The countless changed lives transformed from liabilities into assets to society because of the gospel. Do you agree with that one? That Jesus changed lives completely. Changed lives completely. That's my experience. Christianity made a, a uh, like the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature, a new person. All things has passed away, and behold, everything is made new. So you see about Christianity? Now, we have to understand that the message of Christianity it's a message of improvement. Not only improvement, but of a new creation. That's why some people say, yeah, but I don't like, I don't like your, your Christianity because it's, it's a message of condemnation. It's a message of condemnation. No, no, no. Look what the Bible, what the Bible says in John 3, 16 and 17. It says, I'm giving you the, the, the voice translation. It says, here's the point. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Instead, he is here to rescue a world headed toward certain destruction. So the message of Christianity is not condemnation. Okay? It's not condemnation. That's not the purpose for Jesus coming. And then it says in verse 16, for God expressed his love for the world in this way. He gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not face 
destruction, everlasting destruction, but we'll have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Hmm. So you see, it's a message that people need. Because people need the Lord. It says, whoever believes in him. Okay, I'm just real quick, give you the points so you can remember. Believing in Jesus is not just having uh, an, an intellectual assent that, yeah, I believe that he was a, a historical uh, person. Yeah, I believe that. No, no, no. To believe in Jesus has five things, because we're talking about uh, biblical beliefs, not the way we see it say in secularism, what we think of believing, just accepting something in our minds. Believing in Jesus means that you believe that you're a sinner, okay? You're not God. You're not perfect. You're a sinner. Secondly, that because you're a sinner, you're heading towards eternal destruction, hell. And number two, that I cannot save myself from that eternal destruction. I cannot save myself by being a good person. I cannot save myself by doing good to people. I cannot save myself by belonging to a religion. No. And number four, I have to believe that only Jesus can save me. Only Jesus can save me. And number five, then I have to receive him as my personal Savior and Lord of my life. That's believing in, in Jesus, okay? That's believing in Jesus. All right? Are you ready to face the war on Christmas? <laughs> Do you have some weapons or tools to share with people? Okay? Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the time here together and that, and that we know that we can trust your revelation. We know that you are real. You are a real God, exactly the way it is described, that you are described in the scriptures. And Lord, help us to, to really believe that we can trust the scripture that is uh, a historical reliability uh, of the Bible is really backed by the manuscripts and the, the other historians from the first century. All the many, many prophecies that were fulfilled, the archaeological discoveries and, and the, the changes that Christianity has made through the centuries in, in the world, and especially the countries that have founded their, their government and, and their society according to your word, according to your principles. Lord, help us to truly believe that and to present the real message of Christmas that is not a message of condemnation, but a message of salvation. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and for his honor and glory. Amen.